tuning in online right now. We're so excited to have you hanging out with us today. Well, we have been in a series called Partners in the Gospel where we've been going through the book of Philippians. Uh, and literally, we are just now coming to the end of chapter 2 after 19 weeks of doing this. And so um, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, but today's text, we're going to be looking at a man named Epaphroditus. Anyone ever heard of Epaphroditus? Awesome. One of us, through two, okay, a couple, or at least three of us. Cool, 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 cool. Well, we're going to learn about this guy today. Uh, so if you will, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Verses 25 through 30, you could also follow along in your notes or on the slides. And this is the Apostle Paul writing to the Philippian church, and he says this, But I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, my co-worker, and fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister to my need, since he has been longing for all of you and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Indeed he, was sick, so he, indeed, he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. For this reason, I am very eager to send him, so that you may rejoice again when you see him, and I may be less anxious. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and hold people like him in honor, because he came close to death for the work of Christ risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. Epaphroditus. Not many of us have heard of him, but Epaphroditus was really the type of Christian that we can all emulate. He was really a model partner. You know, this series is called Partners in the Gospel. Paul refers to the Philippian church as his partners in the gospel. And Epaphroditus was somebody that I believe that Paul really points out to, to the Philippian church as someone that they can emulate. And to kind of give us a little bit of context for why Paul is talking about Epaphroditus, a couple verses earlier in uh, uh, verse 20, uh, excuse me, in verses 3 and 4, Paul actually says this. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility Consider others as more important than yourselves, and everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. But rather to the interests of others. And so Paul had said this earlier uh, in this chapter, this idea of humility. And then from there, what Paul begins to do is that he, he begins to give us some examples of what humility looks like. And so we, lo we talked about a couple of the examples over the last couple of weeks. We talked about Jesus, obviously. He starts off with Jesus, who's the greatest example of all, right? He points to him and, and talks about how humble he was and how God honored his humility and how he submitted himself and to his father and, and died on the cross and all this stuff. And so obviously that is our standard, right? As Christians, we follow his example. But let's be honest, though. How many guys know, right? Sometimes when you look at your life and you're trying to live up to Christ's example, sometimes it's challenging, right? If we're honest, it's like, man, you fall short, you make a mistake, and you're like, geez. You know, how many guys have tried being humble like Jesus recently and you, fall sh and you fell short? Anyone? Okay, right? And, and so sometimes it can be a little bit discouraging, right? But that's our standard. That's, and by God's grace, that, that's who we're trying to become like, and, and he's enabling us to do that, right? But then, so Paul uses Jesus as an example, but I think Paul also realized that, yeah, okay, here's Christ. But then what he does, and he's so smart in doing this, he also uses another more tangible example, right? It's someone that the Philippian church would have known, and it was a man named Timothy, David Collinsworth did a great job talking about Timothy last week, if you weren't here. But Timothy was a model example of someone who was selfless, who was humble, who was servant-hearted, who, who put others' needs before himself, right? But even in, to some extent, we can look at Timothy and go, man, I don't know if I can live up to his standard. I, I don't know, because Timothy was actually a full-time minister, we know that he went on to become uh, one of the elders in, in the Ephesian church, and God used him greatly. He was mentored by Paul, and so he represents someone that was in full-time ministry, right? 
And maybe there's some of you guys, you're like, man, you try, maybe you look at people that are up on the platform because you guys think that we have it all together all the time. And so you're looking at us, and, right? And, and you try to compare yourselves. To, or maybe it's not even on this platform. Maybe we're not good enough examples. I don't know. But maybe maybe it's like, you know, you look at like Billy Graham or Mother Teresa. You, you see all these examples out there and you're still like, ah, yeah, I want to be humble like them, but I just don't know. I, I have a hard time. I think Paul realized that. So then he points to this guy, Epaphroditus, who's not a full-time minister. He's not God incarnate. He's just a normal dude. He's just a normal Christian that got saved at the Philippian church somehow. And he points to him as this example of someone who's selfless, who's humble, who's working towards unity, who puts other people's needs, and he is this model partner in the gospel. He's just like one of them. So I was thinking about this message. I got to thinking about like my upbringing and just all the different people that have influenced my life. And I obviously, you know, I can name, you know, my dad was a pastor. And so I, I think about him. I think about other men and, and other women of God that have shaped my life. And even people from afar that many of us would know some of their names and everything like that. But then I got to thinking about some of the Epaphroditus's in my life. Like the no-name Christians that you guys would never even know. You've never even heard of their names. And man, there's a long list of people that you've never heard about that, you know, growing up in church that really shaped my life. And I didn't realize how much they impacted my life, but they were great examples. Different men and women of God that weren't full-time ministers, but that were just faithful. That were just like Epaphroditus. I, I think about the janitor at my church growing up. I was in junior high, and I'll never forget when I first met him. And man, he, he was like this 70-year-old guy, but man, he was so full of life. God had radically saved him, and he was full of joy. And man, he worked with like the best attitude. Talk about having the same attitude of Christ. Like he had that same type of attitude. He was humble, and he, he did everything with joy. Like he would scrub toilets down with joy. He'd clean up, man. If there was, you know, if the church was messy, he didn't care. He would go in there with a good attitude, clean it all up. If tables need to be put out, and this is like a seven-year-old dude, and he, man, he, he, he had so much joy and enthusiasm because of what God had did in his life. I'll never forget, man. Whenever, and, and, you know, this was a Pentecostal church growing up, and so I'll never forget, you know, sometimes during worship, man, old Bob would get to moving. Seven-year-old Bob, he'd do that little Pentecostal two-step. I'd do it for you, but I don't want to hurt my, myself. You know what I'm saying? You, how many guys have you ever seen the little Pentecostal two-step? Man, Bob would, man, he would, just get, he would just get so excited about Jesus. And he was just so faithful. You guys have never heard of Bob until now. But, man, he shaped my life. I thought about this lady named Sean Woodruff. She was a Christian education director, volunteer. She maybe wasn't didn't come across as super spiritual as some of the other ladies. But man, she was just so faithful. Every single week, man, she'd, she'd get to the church early. And we used to have Sunday school back then. How many of you guys remember Sunday school? And man, she'd go in there and she'd make sure that all the teachers had their lessons prepared. You know, if they needed resources, if, you know, she made sure that the rooms were adequate enough to, you know. And man, she was just so faithful. Sweet lady. As a pastor's kid, sometimes... Uh, you know, I would take advantage of that, and I would skip out on Sunday school. That's another story. But anyways, but Sean, I remember she took me underneath her wing. And she, like, kind of, like, she didn't realize this, but she, she was kind of mentoring me. I mean, she, man, I'd, I'd help her out. And for several years, I did that. Woman of God. I thought about this guy named Ed. Ed was a blue-collar worker, a man's man. Never spoke, but didn't, didn't want to speak publicly. You know, he, he was like, you know, he wasn't a preacher. And I'll never forget talking to um, one of his children, and, and I remember them saying, man, I wish my dad was more spiritual. I wish God would use him. And, and, and you know, back then, you know, we didn't, we didn't know anything. But as I look back and I look at Ed's life and I look at the fruit of his life, and he was this blue-collar worker that worked crazy hours, but yet he never missed church. He always made sure that his kids were in church. He loved his wife and his children well. All of them are, now, are still serving God. He, he tithed. He gave. He, he was involved as much as he could be. And he, again, 
many of us would, you know, many people who looked at Ed's life would probably say, oh, man, he wasn't the most spiritual or whatever. But, man, he loved Jesus. And he was a model, faithful partner in the gospel. And that's what I think about. And we could go on and on. And I'm sure there's many of us right now that we're probably thinking about different individuals that maybe we will never know their names, but they shaped your life. And so when I look at this dude named Epaphroditus, that's, that's exactly what I think of. He was just a normal guy that we could look at that is a tangible example of how we as normal Christians doing life together as partners in the gospel can live out this idea of being humble and working towards unity and how we can serve each other. I want us to look at a couple of observations from Epaphroditus' life. Paul says in verse 25, he says, I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother. So let me tell you what's going on here. So Epaphroditus originally was sent by the Philippian church with a care package to go visit Paul, who was in jail in Rome, okay? And he's sent there with a care package to deliver to Paul, and then Paul sends him back with this letter that they are currently, that they would have read out to their church congregation. And so Paul, he's saying, I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus. That's what he's talking about. I'm sending him back to you, Epaphroditus, my brother. Now, it would it'd be easy for us to just kind of skip over this little observation, but this is so important for us to understand something about God's grace. See, we, we have to first see the conversion of Epaphroditus. What's interesting about the name Epaphroditus is that his parents named him after Aphrodite, this pagan, demonic god of lust and sexuality, this goddess that in the Greco-Roman Empire, they worshipped her. And she was this demonic entity. Some of us have heard of, you know, the, the, the letter to the Corinthian church. Well, in the city of Corinth, there was actually a, a huge temple dedicated to Aphrodite. And there was temple prostitution that was taking place. And people would come from all over the ancient world and visit this temple and live it up. It was like Las Vegas of the ancient world. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and so his parents name Epaphroditus after Aphrodite. Her name is in his name. So that tells you a little bit of something about his background. This was not a church-going family. Epaphroditus, he didn't grow up, you know, sleeping in church. He didn't grow up going to Sunday school. His parents were not Jesus worshipers. They had never even heard of Jesus. They worshiped this goddess. And so that can only tell you the kind of lifestyles that they probably lived. The kind of lifestyle that Epaphroditus lived, filled with lust and sexuality and, and just living it up to the full, this hedonistic lifestyle. But something took place in Epaphroditus' life where his life encounters the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ died and rose again for our sins. And he encountered the gospel. We don't know if it came through Paul. We don't know if it came through one of the members at the Philippian church. We have no idea. But somehow his life was completely converted to Jesus. So much so that now he's living his life in response to the gospel, to the good news, to the grace of God. And Paul calls him my brother. My brother. Epaphroditus went from being a pagan, godless worshiper to becoming a brother in the Lord, to being adopted into God's family. This word brother that Paul's saying here is more than just this term of endearment. Paul is referring to this Epaphroditus' new identity in Christ Jesus, that now he is a brother and that's, that's the thing about us as, as Christians. If you're a Christian here today, we need to understand that that is the most true thing about us is our identity in Christ now, that we are now brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. 
that we were orphans. We were spiritual orphans. And when we give our lives to Jesus and we would surrender, and it doesn't matter our background, and we surrender to God's grace in our lives, and God adopts us into his family, and he becomes our, the most perfect father for us. And now we are part of the family of God. Epaphroditus went from being a spiritual orphan to being adopted into God's family. I mean, this is really the story of the Bible, the theme of grace, that God is in the business of, of transforming lives, which is such good news. For anyone that's maybe here today and you walked into this church and you're like, man, I'm the worst sinner in town. I'm jacked up. I'm, I'm, I, I'm just, you know, maybe even right now you're resonating with Epaphroditus and maybe you've lived it up. You've lived life to the full in this hedonistic lifestyle and you're wondering, can God accept me? Can God change me? And look no further than Epaphroditus and see that God's grace is still amazing. God's grace and power can still transform your life. He can change your heart. He can change your desires. And that's what we see in Epaphroditus' life. He was transformed, and now here he is. He's adopted into God's family, and he's a brother in the Lord. And Paul recognizes this about him. And this is the most beautiful thing for all of us as Christians, our identity as sons and daughters of God. Listen to what Romans 8.29 says. For those God foreknew he also predestined what to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Man, if you are a believer here today, you need to recognize your identity in Christ, just like Epaphroditus. You know, the thing about Epaphroditus, though, man, he, we see this conversion. We see something taking place. And you know what? He didn't just stop there. He didn't just like go, okay, cool, I'm saved. And now I can just live life the way I want to. No, man, he was so gripped by the gospel. He was, something took place in his life that now he lives in response to this grace that he has been given. And listen, listen to what Paul goes on to say about Epaphroditus. He says, I consider it necessary to send you, Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister to my need. So the first thing we see is this conversion of Epaphroditus, but now we see the characteristics of his life. That, that's the beautiful thing about God's grace. It not only saves us, but God's grace. And for us as believers, that's why we need to remind ourselves of the gospel. We need, we need to be refueled by God's grace because it should stir us up to live in response and to want to be, to be part of what God is doing. And we see this Epaphroditus' life. Look, 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 listen to what Paul says about him. He says, he's my coworker. He's my fellow soldier. He's, he's your messenger and minister to my need. Essentially, what Paul is saying is that Epaphroditus was a contributor to the advancement of the gospel. And again, listen, keep this in mind. He's not a pastor. He's not an elder. He's not even a deacon that we know of. He's just a normal dude, but Paul calls him all these things. And essentially, this is the second thing that we see. We see the characteristics of Epaphroditus and how they should, they should encourage us as Christians to want to emulate these characteristics in our lives. Again, Epaphroditus experiences the grace of God, but he doesn't just go, okay, cool, I'm going to heaven, and now I can just sit on the church pew and just coast in life. No, he's so gripped by the grace of God that he gets involved. He starts contributing to the gospel. This reminds me of this verse in Titus 2, 14, that says that, Jesus, speaking of Jesus, it says, he gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, just like Epaphroditus. God redeemed him from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession. Eager, what? To do good works. God saves us by his grace. We're not saved by works, but God saves us by his grace so that why? We can contribute by doing good works so that we can continue to advance the gospel so that we can be contributors to the gospel and not consumers. This has kind of been a constant theme throughout this series, this idea of being a contributor and not a consumer. And in the American mindset, there's so many Christians who attend church as consumers instead of being contributors. 
And we look at Epaphroditus' life, and he was like, no, I don't just want to sit on the church pew. Man, I want to make a difference. So much so that look at these characteristics Paul talks about. He says, he, he's, my, he's my co-worker. This refers to him being this, his co-laborer, right? Again, Epaphroditus is not a full-time ministry, but here he is. He is a co-worker. And this word, listen to this, this word in the Greek conveys an affectionate partnership and not merely that of an impersonal official relationship. Like, man, he was involved. He was working for the cause of Christ. And friends, it doesn't matter. You don't need to be in full-time ministry to make a difference. God wants to use you right where you're at. He wants to use you to be his, his fellow co-worker, to advance the gospel of Jesus. Listen to what else Paul says. He says he's my fellow soldier. What's fascinating about this word in the original Greek, if you, if you look at the context, okay, it has this idea of standing shoulder to shoulder. And what it comes from is that during, uh, up until the, the Romans, you know, kind of completely conquered the world, you know, most, most of the armies uh, amongst the nations, um, their soldiers would go out, and they may have had the same uniform, you know, uh, the same war cry, maybe the same face paint or whatever, but they would fight individually. How many guys ever, like, watch Braveheart? Or maybe, like, Lord of the Rings, and, like, you see these war scenes, and it's like, man, it's just chaotic. And I, I, I was thinking to myself, I, we were recently watching Lord of the Rings, and I was, I was thinking to myself, like, man, how crazy would, it, would that have been to fight in these epic battles, and you don't even know who's on your side. You're just, like, going at it. Like, there's, like, thousands of soldiers going at it, right? Like, how chaotic. Well, that's how they used to fight back then, up until the Roman Empire started conquering nations. And they had a different strategy. What they did is that their soldiers would stand side by side. And they were in uniform. And they were strategized. They were, they were, they, you know, they had a strategy. And that's how they conquered. And that's what so Paul says about Epaphroditus that, man, this guy's my fellow soldier. He's, he's shoulder to shoulder with me. Yeah, I, I'm an apostle. I'm in full-time ministry. But this partner, this, this guy from the Philippian church, man, he's so involved in contributing and making such a difference that, man, he is side by side with me. You know, this terminology of soldier, you know, we see that all throughout Paul's writings where he talks about fighting the good fight. He talks about being a, a soldier, right, for Christ. And, 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 and listen, we need to understand something as Christians is that Christianity is a battle to fight. Yeah, Jesus has already won the, the war, you know? But there's these, it's like, that, you know, the enemy's going to steal whatever he, he's going to try to do whatever he can to rob, kill, and destroy He's, he's going to try to do whatever he can to, to influence churches like ours and, and to bring division and discord. He's going to do everything he can within our marriages or with our relationship with our children. Or he's going to use culture to try to come against us. The, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, all these things. Man, Christianity is a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6 says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And we need to understand that. And as Christians, we are called to fight. We're called to fight for the gospel. We're called to fight for our families. We're called to fight for our faith. We're called to, to fight for the future generation. We're called to fight to see God's glory and his name declared amongst the nations. And Epaphroditus, man, he was a wartime Christian. I, I love this quote from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he says, he says this, the main trouble with the Christian church today is that she is too much like a clinic, too much like a hospital. And I, that is why the great world is going to hell outside. Look at the great campaign. Look at it objectively. Look at it from God's standpoint. Forget yourself and your temporary troubles and ills for the moment. Fight in the army. It is not a clinic you need. You must realize that we are in a barracks and that we are involved in a mighty campaign. Friends, are you a fellow soldier? Could Paul say that about us as fellow soldiers for Christ? He goes on to say, my fellow soldier, as well 
as your messenger. Your messenger. We talked about this, how, how uh, you know, he, he, he traveled with this care package, right? And that word messenger is actually where we get the word apostle, but it's not, it, it literally means this. It's a delegate, a messenger, one sent forth with orders, okay? And so he wasn't an apostle. He didn't have the office, but this is where that word comes from. He was sent out by the Philippian church with this care package. Now, here's what I want you to keep in mind. This care package maybe had gifts, you know, maybe had food, but it also had money in it that he was bringing funds to the Apostle Paul to support the ministry, to support the gospel, right? And so think about this. Where Epaphroditus had to travel from all the way to Rome was about over 700 miles by foot. That was a long time. And he was you know, traveling with this care package with money, gifts. You know what that says about Epaphroditus? That he was trustworthy. Think about that. The Philippian church, they looked at his character. They looked at his life, and they're like, hey, we can trust him with this money. We could trust that he's not going to go and go to Corinth and live it up. He's not going to take the money, and you know what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. He's not going to be like that. He's going to steal our funds. He's, we know that we could trust him to take this care package up to the Apostle Paul. And then, not only that, then Paul entrust him with this letter to go back. He was trustworthy. He was somebody that was faithful. He was somebody like my Christian education director, man, that was just faithful. He had character qualities that were godly. Trustworthy. Paul goes on to say that he's your messenger and minister to my need. Minister. Now, is this saying that, is Paul saying that he's a full time minister? Is he, you know, is he on staff at a church, at the Philippian church? No, no, that's not what he means there. That word minister is, is servant. And, and check this out this is a word used to describe the kind of work that priests and Levites did in the Old Testament, in the temple. It's also where we get our word liturgy from. So check this out. Paul's talking about this idea that he's a minister. And really, if you're a Christian, you're a minister. You're a minister by your new identity in Christ. Matter of fact, during the Reformation, this is one of the things that uh, Martin Luther, the great reformer, fought for. Because up until that point, there was a spiritual darkness over the church of Jesus Christ and, and the priesthood, the priest, the Catholic church, all that stuff, it, went, it got corrupt. And, and man, they didn't want believers to recognize that they had access to God just as much as they did. And so Martin Luther started looking at what Scripture says, and one of the things that he, he really coined was the, the priesthood of all believers. And it comes from this idea, 1 Peter 2, 9, where Peter says that you, listen to this, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And Paul is using the same word here, right? The same idea that, that Epaphroditus, is a, he's a minister to my need. Friends, you need to realize that, that you have access to the Father just as much as I do because of what Christ has done through his Holy Spirit. And we need to get this mindset that there is really not a separation between full-time ministers and everyday Christians. We're not more spiritual than you. We're not better than you. No, you are also a minister for Jesus. You are. God has called you to minister. That word minister literally means just to, to be a servant and, and, and to offer up sacrifices. You offer up spiritual sacrifices unto God. And, and listen to this. There's a huge correlation with meeting someone's needs or meeting needs and doing ministry. Huge correlation. Listen to what Paul says here. He says, he, 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 and minister to my need. What is Paul meaning by this? Okay, so think about this. In the Old Testament, the priests, they would offer up spiritual sacrifices unto God, right? They would, they would you know, take care of the sacrifices, all this stuff. Listen to what Paul says here in chapter 4 of Philippians, okay? 
He says, I have received everything in full. I have an abundance and I am fully supplied. So Paul's talking about this care package that he received, okay? I am fully supplied having received from Epaphroditus what you provided. A fragrant, listen to this. Think about the Old Testament priesthood. What did they do? They offered up spiritual sacrifices. Epaphroditus brings a care package to Paul. And what does he say about that? He says, it's a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. So Paul correlates Epaphroditus, who met the apostle Paul's needs, as a spiritual act of worship. Here's here's the point. Every time we as Christians meet a need, do you realize that that is a spiritual act of worship unto God? No matter how small or how insignificant it may be. Every time we do it with a heart that says, I just want to serve others, I just want to be a servant, I want to meet someone's need. You know, maybe it's getting involved in the refuge center. I know they're looking for volunteers, ladies, if you want to get involved in that. Do you realize that that is a a spiritual act of worship? You know, every time that one of our volunteers is, is right now probably in the nursery with your crying baby, that is a spiritual act of worship. <laughs> Volunteers that are making sure that the broadcast happens online, that is a spiritual act of worship. When someone stands at the door greeting you as you came in, it's a spiritual act of worship. Every time you, you go and help your neighbor, maybe cut their lawn or, you know, you know take care of their mail while they're gone. Man, that is a, when you're doing it unto the Lord, it is a spiritual act of worship. And again, This is all about contribution. This is all about, hey, I'm here to make a difference. I'm here to impact others. I'm not here to just live life and twiddle my fingers and just sit on the bench. Man, I'm here to be in the game. That's what Paul's saying about Epaphroditus, man. He is a minister offering up spiritual sacrifices. And when you are meeting needs, whether here in the church or in the community or or even with giving, man, all these needs that take place, man, it is a spiritual act of worship. And we're called to this. We are a royal priesthood. And I believe Epaphroditus got that. He realized that about himself. And check this out. Paul goes on to say about Epaphroditus in verses 26 and 27, he says, Since he has been longing for all of you and was distressed because you heard that he was sick, indeed he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. So first thing we saw was the conversion of Epaphroditus, the characteristics of Epaphroditus. But listen to this. Again, this is this model partner, right, that Paul's, you know, showing us as an example. And the third thing that we see here is the concern of Epaphroditus. Listen to what it says here. It says that he was longing for all of you. That word longing means to desire earnestly, to long for greatly, intensely. It means to have great affection for. So he had this great affection. He, Epaphroditus was 700 miles away from his local church that he looked at as his brothers and sisters in Christ, his spiritual family. And man, he longed for them. He was concerned about them. We've talked about this before, about just how we are called to love each other. And Epaphroditus, again, is this model of someone that, man, loves the church. He longs to be with his church family. He longs for it. I can't but help think how there have been certain Christians just, you know, in this season, just, and I'm talking about in the big C church, that many have stopped going to church and stopped making the gathering of the saints a priority. And I think it's really, for many people, I can't speak for everyone, but I think that for some, some of those individuals that there is a selfishness involved, that there's a lack of concern and a desire to be with their spiritual family. I mean, here Epaphroditus, man, he's 700 miles away, and he's longing, he's concerned about the Philippian church. So much so, okay, Epaphroditus gets sick. We don't know what it was. We don't know if he had the stomach bug. We don't know if he had some fatal disease. We really, we don't know exactly, but he got so sick that he almost nearly died, and the Philippian church hears about how he got sick, 
And they're distressed, which tells you a lot about, again, Epaphroditus, that he was the kind of guy, the kind of Christian that other believers loved to be around. Right? And, and, and they're so concerned about him, and he hears about their distressment that now he's worried about them. He's like, man, I know I'm sick, but I don't want you to worry about me. Man, that, that, think about that, how selfless he was. And that, man, what a challenge for all of us. Because it's so easy, including myself, we get so nearsighted and belly button gazing and looking at our own problems. And again, Paul's in the context of all this. He's talking about being selfless, looking out to the interests of others and not your, not your own interests. And Epaphroditus is his model partner that he's saying, look at him. Look how selfless he was. Look how he, he, he wasn't concerned about how sick he was. He was more concerned about you being worried about how sick he was. This love. And do we love our brothers and sisters that much? Do we love our spiritual family that much that we long to be with each other? That we want to make the gathering of, our, of, of, you know, of the saints a priority? That we want to be with each other? That, that we want to be gathered together in community when we do uh, groups here? That we long to be with each other? And Epaphroditus is a model for us. Paul goes on to say, he says, for this reason, I am very eager to send him so that you may rejoice again when you see him and I may be less anxious. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with great joy that you may rejoice again, right? And then verse 30, 29, listen what Paul says. Therefore, welcome him, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and hold people like him in honor. Because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. Here's the last observation I want us to look at about Epaphroditus, and that's his courage. His courage. Again, keep in mind, this is not an apostle. This is not a pastor. He's just a normal partner at the Philippian church. And listen what Paul says about him. He says, welcome him with the Lord with great joy and hold him in honor. Hold him in honor, like honor him. Why? Because man, look at how he's lived his life. I think Paul, some commentators believe that what Paul's kind of, uh, uh, you know, reflecting on is this idea how Christ humbled himself and then God exalted him. And honored him, right? And it's that same principle. When we humble ourselves, we'll be exalted. We'll be honored, right? And, and Paul's saying, look how humble he was. Now, honor him. Man, show him. Like, look at him. Look at his faith. Look how, he, how he's lived his life. Like, honor him. I believe here at Discover Point, man, there's so many of you that maybe will never be on this platform before. But, man, God sees you. We try to do our best as staff to honor you. And there's so many nameless people in our church that, man, are worthy of honor. that are just like Epaphroditus. People that do things behind the scenes constantly. They're just being faithful and serving. And maybe you haven't been recognized or honored. We try to do our best with that. But, man, God sees it. And, and, and as a church, man, we want to get better at that, at celebrating and honoring those individuals. Because we're called to that. We should celebrate what God is doing through people's lives, right? He tells them to honor him. Why? And listen to this. Because he risked his life. He risked his life. He came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life. We don't even know exactly what took place, but we could only imagine, you know, maybe 700 miles on that trip. There were thieves, robbers, who knows? Maybe when he got to Rome, he maybe came close. Maybe he was in prison. We don't really know. At some point, man, he faced death, and he was willing to face death. He knew the risk involved. But see, he was so heavenly minded that he wasn't concerned about holding on to his life. He risked his life for the work of Christ. Think about that, man. We, we, you know, we love to honor like famous men and women of God like Jim Elliott. That man sacrificed his life. Different martyrs and all these things. These are people that were in ministry, that were missionaries and all that. But man, 
hear Epaphroditus, man, he's just a normal guy, but he loved Jesus so much and he loved the gospel so much. He loved his church so much that he was willing to risk his life. Wow. What a challenge for all of us. Am I willing to risk my life for the cause of Christ? That's, that's, that, like, I ask myself that. I pray that I will be. I pray that, he, that God will give me the grace to do that. That's what he calls me to. And Epaphroditus was willing to do that. What's interesting about this word risk is that in, in, it, it means hazard, to throw aside one's life or to gamble. To gamble, to just risk. You know, listen, I, I love pragmatism. I try to be as pragmatic and practical and everything like that. But sometimes in the kingdom of God, you kind of just have to throw pragmatic, pragmatism to the side. Because God calls us to risk. I mean, look at, look at all the stories, right? Look at all the stories. God calls people to risk. And, and here, Epaphroditus, he risks his life. He gambles with his life. He doesn't know whether he's going to live or die, but just as Paul said, whether to live or die, you know, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It doesn't, doesn't matter. And Epaphroditus had that mindset. He was willing to just risk it all for the cause of Christ. In the fourth century, there was a group of Christians that started ministering to uh, people within their community that, that were diseased. And what's interesting is that they use the exact same Greek phrase for this word risk to describe themselves after Epaphroditus' life. They were willing to risk their lives to minister to people that were diseased and they didn't know whether or not they were contacted, but they loved Jesus, they loved the gospel, and they were willing to risk. And friends, maybe, listen, we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what God calls is going to call us to, but man, maybe it's just a little risk for some of us that we have to take a step towards, whether it's just risking our reputation to stand up for what's right. Or maybe it's a risk to just walk across the street to our neighbor to tell him about Jesus. Or maybe it's a risk to say, you know what? I've been sitting on the chairs for too long. And I've been hurt maybe in the past. I got way too involved. I let people get too close. And maybe it's taking that risk to say, you know what? No, I'm, I'm going to get involved here. I want to make a difference. I want to be a contributor. I'm going to risk getting involved in a small group. I'm going to risk doing life with other believers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to risk. As we look at Epaphroditus' life, again, just a normal, Jesus-loving dude. Normal, Jesus-loving dude. He was changed by the gospel of Christ. And as we reflect on his life today, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Maybe you need to start there with the gospel. And you need to surrender to Jesus today. And in just a moment, you'll have an opportunity to do that. We would love to pray with you if you want to give your life to Jesus. And you watch what God will do in your life. You watch what God will do in your life, how he'll change your heart and your desires. Maybe for some of us, it's like saying, hey, I want to be a coworker. I, I want to be a, a fellow soldier. I want to be a minister, and, and I want to offer up spiritual sacrifices. I want to contribute, and I want to get involved. I want to be a partner in the gospel. If that's you, listen, we, we've talked about like starting point. Man, I want to encourage you to sign up for that and find out how you can get partnered with us. And then lastly, what, what are you willing to risk? What is God asking you to do today? I want us to pray. Our worship team's coming up and we're going to respond here and worship in just a second. I'm going to go ahead and ask our faith coaches to come forward right now as I'm praying. Father, we just come to you. Lord, we thank you for your word that is true and challenges all of us, Lord God. And I pray that as we look at Epaphroditus' life, Lord, that you would just 
speak to us, challenge us, convict us, help us, Lord God. Help us to just respond accordingly, Lord, with whatever you're saying, with whatever you're doing in our lives today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I want you to stand up with me, church. Our faith coaches are down front. If you need prayer for something, if you want to give your life to Jesus, maybe you want to spend some time just reflecting on the cross of what God has done. We have communion available if you're a believer. But either way, let's not, let's just not waste this moment. Let's spend some time in worship, prayer, and reflection. Amen.